Hello there, all of you event planners and future event planners. Today, we've got a great uh, guest for you. Today, we are going to have Juliet Tripp, who is the deputy head of global events for Chemical Watch. So she's an event planner by trade for a large organization. She also is a speaker, a moderator uh, for events that you've probably heard of. So uh, event manage or event blog. So is one of those. Um, and there are others as well. I'll put a link for her website down below. But with that, uh, thank you so much for coming on, Juliet, and we're glad to have you. I love that. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, can we start with a, just a, a simple question? Um, what What is your role kind of in a large uh, corporation doing events now versus, say, 2019? Yeah, sure. So we are a B2B publisher and we organise international and now virtual conferences uh, in chemicals regulations. So all chemicals regulations and sort of product safety compliance. So we beforehand, we organised about 20 international conferences a year. So across Europe, Asia Pacific and the Americas. Um, alongside that, we did smaller events such as training courses um, and focus groups, uh, strategic sort of leadership events things like that and yeah and then obviously the world changed so from April 2020 we moved everything online so we're now running a fully virtual program um, we actually have run hybrid events since 2018 so we always used to live stream our conferences and have that kind of aspect so we were kind of ready and no one was ready that's a stupid <laughs> thing to say um, but I feel like you know we were we had our head around it we knew when the world started changing virtual wasn't a completely new concept to us so we were able to um to shift to move to pivot i hate the word pivot but you know um and and now we're running even more events so even more events virtually and we have kind of worked hard on creating new experiences for our community um new ways of experiencing events we've just launched a professional development component of our membership which is like enterprise-wide access to all of our events which is really exciting it's just you know it's a new world ideally miss live events but it's a new world and, and we're here we're in it now <laughs> yeah I think we're, we're going to be in it forever, at least partially. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I know for a fact that you are also a, a content creator. So you've been doing that probably since 2018, 2017. Uh, yeah. And you probably create some of the most binge worthy Instagram stories I've seen. So congrats, <laughs> congrats on that. Um, you know, how would you, how would you say your experience with content creation helped you look at um, and coach perhaps presenters uh, and speakers for for your virtual events? Yeah, this is such a great question. I think at the end of the day, we're all people. So people buy from people. We like to build up that no like, and trust factor, right, in our community and the people that we're engaging with. And at the end of the day, whether you are presenting to your Instagram story or you're presenting on stage or at a virtual event, we're all human and actually just showing up as you um, as unscripted as possible unscripted is different from unrehearsed um, <laughs> but just being you and you know smiling and bringing that human element I guess um, relaxing into it as much as you can is something that I've really really tried to to bring and I guess it helps being both sides and um, having the speaking experience as well I know the pain points I'm not a tech person by trade at all so I think I know the stupid questions that people feel free too afraid to ask and I can try and help with that as best I can. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh man, so true. So I I guess, you know, as you as you continue on with virtual events, because you've been doing them almost a year now, um are are there things that you've kind of learned or things that you are now applying from virtual events in your uh, content creation or vice versa? Or are, are you seeing other trends that are kind of overlapping? Yeah, um, I think it's, you know, they're very different things. And I, the content that I'm putting out to the world is is very different than my day job. But ultimately, it's just having a strategy behind it, whatever your audience is. And I think strategy 
is the trend. It's the one trend which will always be my core value. It will always be the most important thing to me and the events that I'm producing, the content that I'm creating, because ultimately we've got to know our why, we've got to know our end goal. And I think that's something that translates across the board in many different industries, but many different content outputs. So, you know, if you are starting a podcast, why are you starting a podcast? Who's that for? If you're creating a virtual conference, What's the strategy behind that? How is that going to help you meet your business goals or how is it going to drive revenue or whatever it is? But I think that's something as well. Like I'm being more strategic about what I'm posting, mainly because I don't have I don't have the time. I wear a lot of hats. I juggle a lot with side hustles and, and full time work. So I have to be strategic and I, I drill down into my niche. And, you know, if you do follow me on social media, you'll know that I only post a few sort of topics. So international events management a personal development, goal setting, event strategy, that's really it. And by focusing in on that niche, as we do at Chemical Watch with our events, we know our niche, we know that we are a player in that field and we go for gold in that field rather than just experimenting and doing everything. Yeah, so I yeah think I mean, that's, that's, my, a, that's my trend. That's a great point. Um, and yeah, I think what you've done really well um, from what I see of your Instagram is cultivating a relationship. Um, and I think that's so invaluable and it's so, um, it is so hard for some presenters to, to come across in that same manner digitally as they would in an in-person conference where you, you expect that you're going to walk up and, and shake someone's hand afterwards or give them a hug or all the things that we miss about in person. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, do you think that's a one, one hit kind of thing or, or it takes time to build? Like, how can you, how can you cultivate that at, at a conference that's, all online it's hard it's really hard and i i'm a performer i'm an extrovert i liked being on the stage i presented at five virtual events last week and by the end of the week i was more drained than i've ever been presenting at live events i found i find it more draining of my energy because i don't know you can't read the room like you yeah. don't know if people are laughing smiling supporting you so what I try to do is build that rapport and that relationship, whether I'm a speaker or an event manager, um, with that community. As you say, building a community, building relationships is absolutely vital. So can you start reaching out to people using the event hashtag on social media? Can you start a conversation on LinkedIn and find out what people are looking forward to about the event? Can you meet up with them in a virtual networking room beforehand and check how their day is going? Like all these little touch points so that when you do get on that stage virtually, they know you. They know you as that friendly person that reached out that said, you know, I'm here for you. I'm presenting on this topic. Like, how can I make this experience better for you? And that that can be across the board, whether you are um, a speaker, an organizer, a, a marketeer a sponsor or a partner of an event um you know i think we all have that responsibility for our communities to show up for them and and create these moments like it's all we have right now so we yeah. have to go all in on it yeah i mean that, that's a beautiful way to put it thank you for that thank you so i mean i guess when you when you say it like that what what um role or what responsibility do you think from from your event planner side of your brain do you think your presenters that you're bringing on your keynotes your whoever um do they have a responsibility or going into 2021 and, and throughout will they begin to have a larger responsibility to actually cultivate those relationships in advance which is i, I think what we're talking about yeah uh, i think so i think so it's i mean it's different for every event but ultimately you get in what you no, you get out what you put in. That's what I mean. Um, so you are going to be more trusted, more liked, more valued, the more that you show up for that community with whatever that objective is. So I think it is important. And as soon as the world changed last year, you know, how many free webinars, Instagram lives, virtual events were you seeing? Like it was day in, day out. It was constant, which is fine. But now we're used to them. And we, we invest in them. You know, we're ready to invest. <clears throat> you know, I buy tickets to virtual events because they're something that I know I'm going to get value out of. If I am paying um, for a ticket, I expect good presenters that know what they're doing. I expect moderators that can bring the audience along for the ride. You know, the role of a moderator is absolutely crucial. And we're not just winging it anymore. 
like we've got to show up and be there for our audiences and and know what their goals are and look at how we can curate that experience for them so that they ultimately get what they came for yeah i think that's a beautiful point um and, and a great segue you um you mentioned moderators and I know you do some moderating. <laughs> so, you know, when you are moderating, how, how would you say that's different? And, and are there things that you're being more intentional about? Um, because the platforms are so all, so all over the place, right? So, some of them, you can't see your attendees. Some of them, yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it's a very uh, surreal and different experience, I'm sure for everyone involved. So as a moderator, what do you see your role as? think it's the connector like you are that person that everyone relies on that everyone knows you are the friendly face from first thing in the morning to last thing at night sometimes and you are the person that connects those people beyond the screen at home or in their home office with um, you know the rest of the speakers and you have that topic or that goal and you weave it into every conversation you keep the conversation going even if it stops, even if your speakers fall apart and they forget their answer to a question, like you're the one that picks them back up, that empowers them to speak up and really gets the words out of their mouth and, and you know, cultivates relationships between the speakers. Say you're moderating a panel, you know, are you building these relationships between people? So like gone are the days where moderators just go around the circle and ask everyone the same question. And if moderators are still doing that, then we need new moderators. Like we need to just do this in, in new ways. And like, if you don't know the topic, if you're not a subject matter expert, um, then just do a little bit of research, do enough research. So you really know, and you get it um, because you can be caught out as a moderator. I've been caught out before. If I'm moderating a session that I don't really know, you know, I know events, but events is a big world and there's stuff that I don't yeah. have experience in, especially on the tech side. So you, you have to wing it a little bit, but, but know enough, know enough about the content, about the audience, about the speakers, definitely. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think you're right. You know, moderators now more than ever are, are kind of this through line from the beginning to the end of the event. Um, and, you know, uh, I had someone on a few weeks ago, um, Stephanie uh, Liu, who suggested, you know, the, the best thing that she's seen are those presenters like herself who uh, attend the sessions before her so that she can string you know, key points from, from their um, session into hers. And I think moderators have a much larger responsibility now in, in helping because some presenters still aren't doing that. Um, it's, it, you know, it, it's a very different um, expectation, perhaps, that we put on moderators and MCs. And I yeah. wonder, are they more critical now than ever? Yeah, I think so. People expect more. We expect more from everything. Like, you know, we know that virtual events are not just Zoom calls anymore. They're not just webinars. They're so much more than that. So therefore, the moderator's game is so much higher and they have they have to storytell. They also have to be the person that picks things up when things go wrong or if there is a technical fault, which still happens and it will happen because we're all human and connections break and you know we do our best but but that moderator should be able to seamlessly um keep the audience happy or you know come back and recover from things so there is that expectation because your moderator is on the front line and often they're going to be the ones seeing those angry comments in the chat box which oh. you know we're still you, we still see them and what really infuriates me is when we see it at event industry events because I know that we're allowed to be critical, but we sh we're in it together. Like we're all facing issues and why can't we support each other? It's so frustrating when you see all these comments coming through, like the sound's not working or can't hear that presenting. I think, you know, the people on the other end know that they're probably trying to fix it. Just help them. Like we're all in the same boat here. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. Don't, don't, um, don't tag on, right? <laughs> Once is yeah, enough. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I guess, you know, your work as a moderator now is um, in some ways um, more valuable than than a, a presenter or a, a, uh, an event planner, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't really seen that uh, play out as a trend yet. There are still so many events who aren't uh, throwing a lot of budget um, at a moderator versus a, a keynote. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to change? Yeah, I mean... 
everyone has their different priorities and long live the keynote like we all build our events around the keynote I get that but but I think yeah the keynote might be there for 15 minutes at a virtual event the moderator's there all day like we need to we need to rewrite the narrative on that I think and um, you know, we use internal moderators a lot at Chemical Watch, but um, we've invested quite a lot in their training. So they've had moderator training or we've bought them a good microphone. Like <laughs> it's, it doesn't need to be super complicated. If you don't have the budget to hire a TV presenter, not everyone does and you don't need to. But look at how you can elevate the experience of the people that you do have by your side to moderate or you know, the people within your community. Um, but yeah, I think definitely the, the role of the moderator has to be up the list. And the one big reason for that is hybrid is on its way. And the moderator is crucial in hybrid because they really are holding more together than ever before. And they have to command the room and they have to command um, the platform also. So it's 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 big. It's it, there's there's a lot riding on the role of the moderator. Yeah. You know, I think one of my favorite bits of advice um, recently is. Um, if you if you can't afford a proper MC, hire your local TV journalist. They've been yeah. here and they've watched it fail, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, so I, true. Or don't do an event, <laughs> or just don't do the event. Um, have true. someone that can at least at least try. But yeah, definitely, it's it's important. Yeah. So when you're the speaker, then and you're interacting with the moderator and everyone else, trying not to look at the Q and A where all the filthy comments lie. Uh, you know. How do you how do you interact now versus um, when it was in person? I feel like in person, one, a lot of us got lazy. The moderator went around and asked the same question. Two, we were all able to see one another's visual cues. I could watch when your legs moved and knew that you were about to answer or, or watch your facial expressions or whatever. Um, and we're lucky if we even see people's hands now, right? So uh, how how are you adapting to that? How much more difficult is that? It is difficult and it all comes in in training, definitely. And I've certainly been guilty of when we first moved to virtual and I was speaking on panels and things of, of jumping in. I generally talk too much anyway. That's a fault that I need to work on. <laughs> but, you know, it was it was easy to just jump in and um, and speak at the same time and overlap. But I think the moderator can control that. And as a moderator, you learn to phrase the questions. So you kind of bring in the name at the front end of the question rather than just at the end. And so, um, you know, we're going to be discussing event industry trends and Joe, I'll be asking you first what your thoughts are on virtual trends. And then, you know, because you're prepped and the other speakers know if they're listening. So stuff like that, I guess. But um, but just knowing, like, know your moderator, even if you don't have the opportunity to meet up with them for coffee, as we would have done at a conference, um, get to know them, have a call with them and see what their style is, because every moderator and every speaker is different. Um, but ultimately, they should be the, guiding the conversation and making sure that they are directing questions in the right way. You know, sometimes these sort of things are pre-planned. So as a speaker, you know that really this is the area you're going to be contributing the most. But, you know, thing, things change and, and you might it might be a bit more dynamic. And actually, that's OK still. It's OK if there's a little bit of speaking over each other because there are still going to be heightened discussions and um, topics that might get a little bit dramatic if people are really passionate about it. Um, so that's, yeah, it's worth bearing in mind that we are still human and we do our best, but it's not always going to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a little bit actually helps people realize this is live, right? This isn't some taped affair. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, if you if you take that and then you kind of couch it in your your day job as an event yeah. kind of planner and um, do you think more emphasis or do you now um specifically have your moderators um reach out to talent further in advance do you do more rehearsals or kind of dry runs or, or whatever the case may be and i know that some of um, the people who are going to watch this do not have the luxury of in-house moderators but from your perspective I, I would love to hear you know does that make a difference and do you do it um, yes and yes. So when I say we have in-house moderators, they are within the business. They're not within the studio. Um, so we're a, we're a global company and we're our colleagues. Obviously, we're in lockdown um, and our colleagues are not always able to come in 
to us in our kind of studio, which is which is our office, but turned studio. Um, so we have to have prep calls. So we have to check in and even it doesn't need to be a really big planning meeting where everyone discusses every topic. It's just as simple as introducing them. Um, so we actually um, do quite a bit of pre-recorded content just because to mitigate any risks and we edit them all together. So it's quite high production value. So not everything is live in our virtual events. Don't shoot me. Um, <laughs> but but it means that when we play out those um, pre-recorded, edited um slick presentations then we've got behind the scenes the moderator and the speakers chatting throughout so talking about the topics that are coming up looking at the questions coming in discussing who might answer each question and then by the time we go back live like they're so briefed and ready to go because they've had that rapport and that relationship and they've discussed the topics as they happen which has been really really valuable yeah it's um Almost an unfair advantage. <laughs> it is an unfair advantage. I'm very sorry. I know not everyone's in that position. But if you can't be, then, yeah, look at how, how you can leverage those meeting opportunities in advance. It's so valuable. And it, as I say, everyone's busy, but it, it could just be a 15-minute call, just an introduction. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, gosh, this, this may be overselling it, but I think when they can have a video call, uh, at least getting to see each other's mannerisms in a short call, you can pick up a yeah. lot about um, how someone may or may not interact. So yeah. I, I'm just so um, keen on those when they're possible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's not always possible, but but yeah, it's almost a prerequisite now for speakers when we're booking them and moderators. We kind of let them know that this is this is how we do things and why always good to tell them the why because if people are new to virtual speaking still of which many are they might still not have done it um they might not understand they might think well i'll just i'll send you a video and then i'll show up on the day but actually make sure that they know the reason you're doing everything like why you're mitigating risks why you need to hold their hand more so than you would at a live event and and all the reasons behind that because it's just going to help them buy into your um your planning and everything you need them to do a lot more yeah, that's so true. Um, yeah, and I think helping them understand what your um, risk mitigation or your, your troubleshooting process is, because, you know, maybe the moderator's the one who has a bad connection that day. Uh, mm -hmm. So having a game plan for that and everyone knowing who's on first, so to speak, because uh, yeah. the last thing that you want or I've wanted is to have the voice of God come in and say, uh, I think we're having technical difficulties. James, could you take this question? Yeah exactly um yeah it's just pre-planning it's prepping and looking at how you can mitigate those risks but have backup plans that are slick and that don't let your production values down so for example do you have like a trailer or a bumper video that you can just play if everything goes wrong and you just need to buy yourself some time or do you have someone ready to come on camera and explain or do you have a message that comes up on the screen things like this we think that we think that we don't need them one day we do need them and then we never forget them true sadly true <laughs> yeah <laughs> we all learn the hard way with these things i think yeah so you know are there are there things that you um, now find indispensable or maybe you don't use all the time hopefully but you always have on the ready is there something in your checklist that you know like it's got to be here um that's such a good question i think we yeah again i'm very blessed because i have an in-house production team who are incredible who run um who run the actual production side and all the av for our on-site conferences but are virtual as well and they've really taken the lead so they they're just in control and i think having like a lead for the event who is just calling the show who knows what's going on at any point and that can step back from the front line and see the bigger picture and be ready to pick up on any issues is brilliant um but yeah briefing the moderators i think your moderator is your secret weapon in a lot of scenarios and having things that you know you can kind of play whether that's like a pre-recorded uh bumper segue thing um can be really helpful as well but i think as long as you're communicating and you've got a real clear line of communication between those that are 
on site in your studio or maybe you're all remote I know a lot of event peers right now are running fully remote events where they've just got people scattered in their own homes um so have you even got like a whatsapp group or a slack channel or anything so there's just one place it sounds simple but it's the simple stuff we forget we can do a really complicated run of show but actually when it comes down to it are you going to be looking at that run of show or actually is it easier just to have you know a phone on whatsapp where you've got everyone there on the speed dial yeah and hopefully your WhatsApp is on your phone data and not <laughs> stuck on your Wi-Fi yeah. <laughs> when the failure no. occurs, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. Exactly. But yeah, think about that as well. Yeah. So I guess thinking through this, the next big um, push, I would say, is, is hybrid, is the thing that everybody wants to yeah. talk about and dream of. Uh, and I have clients doing hybrids now almost weekly. Yeah. Um, what would you say the role of a moderator or moderators will be for hybrid? Because uh, I know what hybrid looked like for us before the pandemic when, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the digital audience was a second-class citizen, so to yeah. speak. Um, do you think there will be a designated moderator perhaps for the digital side and one for the in-person side? Or, or, or there'll be some other uh, arrangements to, to give them more... Um, Parody. Yeah, I think it could be a bit of both. And I have seen some omni channel events that have sort of a different moderator in each location, whether that's a virtual location or a studio um, or, you know, different studios across the world. Even I think that can be great because those moderators build up a rapport and there's almost this like competitive nature of them um, between the regions and that nice like bouncing around each other. I think that's great. Um, but if you have, you know, if it's a smaller event, you just have one moderator, like how are they going to be connecting? Have they got an iPad where they're seeing the comments coming in? Have they got an earpiece and you're feeding it through to them? Like, what does that actually look and feel like? And then as well as the importance of a moderator, never under, underestimate having strong customer service. Like, have you got people who are just in the chat and they are part of the events team and that's all they're doing? Because we have that a lot of the time at our virtual events, especially early on. We needed someone whose role was literally to be answering the phone, to replying to messages or on emails, whatever. Um, and they didn't have any other responsibilities that day because we knew we could give them our all. So don't underestimate having those people who are kind of behind the scenes, but the customer facing side to help weave things together and pick up on those problems because the moderator will not have time for every single issue, especially like, oh, the screen's frozen. And then nine times out of 10, I find we just say, can you just use Google Chrome? And it fixes it. That's like <laughs> yes. my hack for everything. <laughs> So true. You, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, speaking of chat moderators and, and having someone uh, delegated to that task, uh, one of my favorite tips for events, particularly small events, is bring your intern or whoever. <laughs> one yeah. person is managing chat and questions. Another person is managing pasting things into the chat. Because yeah. one of the greatest value adds that I've seen in events has been um, when a speaker gives you a link that you've never heard of, if they, if they audibleize it, someone should post that for your attendees to, yeah. to track it down, right? And so yeah. figuring out really how how finite you want those roles to be and, and what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you found that true or not, but you know, links yeah. and some of the other things that you can paste and add on the spot really seem yeah. to add value and, and people appreciate it. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I, I know that not all virtual platforms allow you to have links, but the ones that do, they should all do that now, right? Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, definitely, um, definitely try and look at that and just having people pick up on things. You mentioned early on Event MB, Event Manager Blog, and they actually do something which is really cool. And they have someone who's designated for social media or a couple of people because their events are huge and they feed in comments and questions from social media. And I just love it because it feels really live. It feels really exciting. Um, and I've seen this done very, very well once I've been um, an attendee or behind the scenes as a speaker. And, and it's just been really cool to say, right, let's go over to the social channels and see what's happening. And by then, the social media people have been like, scouring the Twitter feed, finding the best comments and photos, putting it into the production team. And then it goes on the screen. And, and I think that's that's great. And the moderator wouldn't necessarily have time to do that at all either. So just look at who you've got available and how you can really plan. Like we all have roles when we're on site so why don't we all have separate roles virtually um, we can't all do everything all of the time yeah I, yeah and I think maybe that goes back to something you said earlier as well 
um, you know, you mentioned building community and rapport and, um, gosh, I, I don't think there's anything more exciting in a digital event than somebody actually calling your name and asking your question or, or having your comment, right? Like it is such a small so thing, cool. but when you hear your name or someone else that you know's name called out, you automatically get a little smile and, and you perk up and you're, you're ready to listen for 20 more minutes, right? It's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. It's just a power and I'm noticing this across the board. So a really um, non off topic um, example, which isn't really conferencing is that I, um, I love my fitness. I've always worked out, but I lost my motivation like at the start of lockdown thinking, how am I going to be able to keep this up? But actually um, there's a big gym chain called Barry's Bootcamp, um, which held themselves as the best workout in the world. And I truly believe they are. But anyway, they started doing Zoom workouts and you're on screen. So you put your camera on and the instructors are calling out your name. So once you're doing all this like really high intensity workout, they're saying, come on, Juliet, you've got this only 10 seconds. To... And like, it's stuff like that. And if they can do it in a Zoom workout, we can do it at our virtual conferences. Like if anyone can make you carry on doing press ups at six in the morning in your living room <laughs> with dogs running around and all sorts, then, then let's we can do that at our conferences too so that's another thing like you know just find out who's listening in and give them a shout out it doesn't need to be cheesy i run chemicals regulations conferences it's not fun content it's not exciting content but you can still be there for your attendees and find out you know like we've started asking people now like let us know um where you're joining us from today in the chat yeah. and we never used to do that because we thought oh it's too cheesy our audience won't like it they're too serious they they will think it's a distraction but actually they started engaging now and it's lovely and it's nice to see who's listening in and Again, it's the human connection piece. We're all human. And we'd be saying hello if we were at the drinks reception with a glass of wine. So we can do it in the chat box. Right. Just bring your own glass of wine. Um, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, how does that um, or does it play into your event goals? Do you, do you anticipate and think of some of those things? Do you actively, do you have some metric or some standard for how much engagement you want of, of various kinds? Or, or how do you set event goals? Yeah, oh, well, I'm I'm all about the goals in every area of my life, especially events. Um, but I think we can look at how we can bring in these sort of metrics, as you say. Now, I don't have like set metrics for engagement because every event's different and every audience is different. But I would like to create something like that. That's like a benchmark that we go towards. But it goes back to ROI and it's not just ROI anymore, um, return on investment. It's now like returning on engagement and, you know, your sponsors and just every single piece of it, content and looking at every single piece of the puzzle. And actually, what does that look and feel like to you? Is it 60% of your delegates downloading some presentation slides or is it um, seven out of 10 delegates going to a sponsor booth? Um, you can set these goals yourself and you can set them in line with your stakeholders goals, you know, talk to each other, work out, especially if you're working with partners, speak to them. What are their goals and how can you as a, the event planner help them reach them? Um, and just so those are good things. But yeah, just looking at how many conversations are created or you know whether it's one-to-one -one meetings if that's something that you do or downloads of content or downloads of white papers or showing up to a virtual meeting room or uh, showing up to the plenary session whatever that looks and feels like for you I think anyone can set goals if you feel like you're kind of just going along and just making stuff happening happen and trying to tread water at the moment go back to your why and start to set some small goals for all your team to work towards um, because it can become quite you know an engaging interesting process it gives us all something to aim for and to improve on next time yeah that's so true um and it's very useful in digital events in particular, uh, where we have more ability to, to take some of those metrics uh, to help garner sponsorships, which seem like they're they're becoming fleeting in some respects, um, because yeah. sponsors and exhibitors may not understand the ROI, or they may not see the same ROI. So mm -hmm. having some way to tie their dollars back to benefit yeah. to them is, is critical. Yeah. And you live and you learn with these kind of things. You know, I think across the boards, whatever industry you're in, it was difficult at the start to communicate the value of virtual events. And we certainly had sponsors who sat back and said, oh, I'll just wait till you go back to live. 
and now surprisingly not surprisingly they're the ones picking up the phone now saying okay well obviously we're still in a pandemic so yeah we're interested in this whole virtual thing talk to us how does it work um and so how can you replicate those things because before it was all business cards and it was they they were just counting the business cards that they got on their table so how can you bring in those metrics it's really really easy because often the people that are on the floor on the show floor as um, as sponsors maybe they're not the ones that actually have the ultimate responsibility they need something really tangible that they can go back to their heads of department with or their senior leadership team to to show them that it was worthwhile or it wasn't worthwhile being at that event so how can you make that easy for them yeah, and do you think there there are strategies that are are best for that um, with virtual events? Um, I think understanding their objectives again, it's just like have that candid conversation with the marketing manager or business development or whoever reaches out to you about the sponsorship. Find out person to person. Don't just send them a document and say, "Well, this is what's included." You know, once you've paid, we'll get it ready for you. Yeah. Actually, say, "What are you looking for from this event?" Like. What else have you seen? What's worked well for you? What's worked not well for you? Like we're all in this together. We're navigating this crazy, crazy Corona coaster, which never seems to end. So like, just, just speak to them, be honest and, and know that it's okay to maybe blur the boundaries a little bit and, and create tailored exhibitor packages based on what people's goals are and, and how you can help them hit them. Because ultimately, if you want the ROI for them and for yourself, you want to make it an experience they're so ready to book again um so yeah try and take that stress away and yeah it might be a little bit more work at the start but then hopefully it should be easier throughout the process yeah i mean i wonder how much um imposter syndrome plays into not asking those questions up front uh because i remember you know as early as june uh, maybe even before uh, any event that i was helping a client with i would go back and say can i um interview your exhibitors and sponsors and a high percentage of them said yeah why would you do that it's like just curious just want to know what's going on um and the sponsors loved it exhibitors loved it and mm -hmm. they provided some incredible feedback uh still to my to this day my my favorite bit was um an exhibitor said we missed the lunches i was like you guys can't afford food what's going on here and uh she goes no we would send five people one to each table at lunch because we knew the attendees wouldn't get up and leave while they're eating. And so that was their big yeah. chance to speak to yeah. people. And that's a very uh, curious insight that you don't get if you don't actually ask the questions. So yeah. I, I love that. Yeah, exactly. You've got to keep talking to people. So when we started, when we were maybe a month into our pivot, um, I just ran a load of focus groups with some of our key event advocates. So people that spoke at our events, people that attended events year after year or sponsors that kept coming back and just held a space for them to discuss their pain points, what they wanted to see more of, what they were nervous about as well um, with the word of, world of virtual and how we could make that experience less nerve wracking, how we could make it easier and, and more enjoyable for them. And actually from having that buy-in, a lot of those people that are on those calls and there were small groups, it's like you know eight or nine people, but they're the ones that are showing up. They're the ones that are happy to speak or happy to help me with stuff. But it's because I was open and vulnerable with them as an event planner saying, look, we're trying to navigate this right now like how can how what do you need from us because it is difficult but we're here for you and it just it was so valuable and it just surprises me so much that there are still people being like oh we'll do a virtual event because everyone else is doing them without thinking of the strategy and the why um i just don't know it's not sustainable um so yeah just try doing stuff like that as you say ask people like have a conversation that's what we're able to do. And often it's the candid conversations that you find out the most, like just before they go live, you can quickly ask a few questions. Just make sure you've got a pen so you can write down the answer. <laughs> Pro tip there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Heard it here first. <laughs> oh, awesome. You know, um, yeah, I mean, these are all great. I, I guess I, I do have one uh, slightly off topic question. There are a lot of books in your, your uh, yeah. bookcase over there. If there were three books you could recommend to event planners in these strange times, what would those be? I have to look at my shelves now. Look at my shelves. I've got, yeah, I've got color-coded bookshelves. I'm one of those people. <laughs> um, so, 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 so. Um, I think that 
I've got so many. Um, there's a book called The Strategy Book, which is really simple, but it's by a guy called Max McCown. And it's all the principles of strategy, how you can use them, how you can be more strategic, how you can start strategic conversations. So it's not necessarily events, but it's really, really helpful. Um, another great one is Atomic Habits, which I think a lot of people have read um, recently. And again, not necessarily event planners, but because we live really busy lives, it's how you can kind of create more small habits that build up and then create big moves and, and lead you towards your goals and how you can like stack uh, positive habits together that's super interesting and I learned stuff from that that I could then implement like with my team and with myself and my own role and um, you spoke about imposter syndrome and um, and goal setting and it might be more of a, a female oriented book but um, Rachel Hollis's Girl Stop Apologising is just incredible um, I think for anyone in terms of setting goals being unapologetic unapologetic in pursuit of your goals um, and just realizing that you can absolutely make stuff happen she used to be an event planner as well before she kind of went into the world of personal development and I think every time I read it I know she's been there I know she's done it all <laughs> so it's yeah so those are my top three Awesome. I can share the links as well if anyone needs them. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, those are great. I have to check one or two of those out. I don't have all yeah, three. Definitely. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, is there anything I forgot? I don't know. I think we've covered so much, so much. Um, yeah, I guess my takeaway is always know your why, go back to your why, and don't be afraid to like ask questions ask questions all the time um i think we've we've all been navigating this there might be some people listening who have never done still never done virtual events and it's new to them and they feel a bit anxious know that this is all still they're still fairly new to us ask the questions because there are people who are willing to help um you know i was the one i'm you know i'm a true blonde i'm always asking stupid questions but luckily i've got people i know who to go to um and i ask the questions that people are too afraid to ask because i've been there so so know that you know you've got people that you can call on certainly the event profs community because there are people who don't just want to sell you stuff. there are a lot of people who want to sell you stuff right especially virtual platforms <laughs> but there are people who actually <laughs> so are happy true. to help you yeah so just you know keep talking we're in it together awesome thank you so much julia for joining us um for all of you planners plan on coming back next thursday we'll have another great guest and we look forward to seeing you then